He's, he's, he's supposed to hold it like Corbière. Wait, wait, wait. But, like Napoleon era Corbière. Who? My friend, he was a Prussian field marshal back in the day. It was a big deal. Yeah, I, I know it sounds French, but, but no, it's not. He was actually born in Maastricht, actually. Uh-huh. Wait, 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 wait. He's supposed to hold it like Colbert. So, 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 like, as if Napoleon's army was attacking it. <laughs> Good luck with that. Huh? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> February 17th, 1945. Stubbornly, they have held out, week after week and day after day, fighting to the last as one city block, then another falls to the Red Army. But now they can fight no more, and the city finally falls. This week is the end of the Siege of Budapest. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, there was an Allied leadership conference at Yalta. In Alsace, the Allies crushed the Colmar pocket. They also tried to launch two new operations further north towards the Rhine, though the Germans flooded the Ruhr River, which delayed one of them indefinitely. In the Philippines, the battle for Manila began, and it was bloody. And on the Eastern Front, the Soviet attacks continued, though not as forcefully as before. And it became obvious they couldn't just take Berlin off the march. Both Konstantin Rokossovsky's 2nd Belarusian Front and Ivan Chernyakovsky's 3rd Belarusian Front began renewed attacks at the end of last week, and those attacks continue this week. On 2nd Belarusian Front's left, 70th Army do advance, but in the center they only make like, like 15 kilometers total, and they are held up by encircled, fortified German garrisons and ice in the Vistula River. They do come close to making some good gains, though. They reach Hoynitsa the 14th, and if they can break through there, Walter Weiss's German Second Army will be cut off in West Prussia. When Weiss asked permission to evacuate Grudziaz, contending that he could either keep the contact on his right or defend West Prussia and the ports Danzig and Gdynia, but not do both, Himmler had answered that Second Army had three missions. Keep a secure contact on its right, protect the ports, and hold Grudziaz. In the latter instance, it was to follow the great example of Corbière. Examples from the Seven Years' War and the Napoleonic Wars had recently become popular in Hitler's circle. And unfortunately for many a German soldier, it seemed that nearly every old Prussian city had successfully withstood a siege in one war or the other. Second Belarusian Front is unable to break through, though, and Rokossovsky will stop the offensive in a couple days. Third Belarusian Front's attacks, with 63 divisions and two air armies, are against well-prepared defenses and stubborn defenders, and grind out only one or two kilometers per day. On the 13th, however, they have pushed German Fourth Army out of the Heilsberg Triangle, and Ivan Bagramian's First Baltic Front has pushed Armee Abteilung Samland to the tip of the Samland Peninsula. So Königsberg is at least isolated. But heavy snowfalls early in the month, followed by a sudden thaw, had snarled Soviet supply movements and interfered with air operations. First Baltic Front, short on equipment and ammunition from the start, did not have first-class troops or leadership. The presence of two major commands operating against three separate groups in a small area induced on the Soviet side something like a muscle-bound condition. As for Georgi Zhukov's first Belarusian front, his right flank has to deal with a German counterattack this week. This kicks off the 15th, run by Walter Wenck, attacking for Heinrich Himmler's Army Group Vistula as its new chief of staff. And it breaks through the Soviets at Answalde and recaptures Piritz. Whether or not the attack can do more is kind of a moot point, since today the 17th, Heading back from a meeting with Adolf Hitler, Wenck takes the wheel from his driver and crashes the car. Okay, there is a bit more to it than that. He must attend such meetings daily, which entail a round trip of 320 kilometers. And both he and his driver are exhausted. His driver collapses, so Wenck takes the wheel, falls asleep at the wheel, and crashes and gives himself a fractured skull and some broken ribs. With him out of the picture, the attack falters. Earl Zimke calls that counterattack. 
one of the war's closest approaches to a planned fiasco. The original idea, which I talked about weeks ago, was Heinz Guderian's, and it was a two-pronged attack to cut off the tip of the Soviet spearhead. But Guderian had pushed for six SS Panzer Army to be one spearhead, but they're on their way to Hungary on Hitler's orders, so it's now a single prong from the Stargard area. OKH did manage to pull together Force Fort, two corps headquarters, seven Panzer divisions, and three infantry, though getting them into place on what's left of the German rail network is nearly impossible. On the 13th, Guderian meets with Hitler and demands that Wenck command the offensive, so Hitler tells Wenck to go to Army Group Vistula with a special mandate. But he did not say what Wenck's authority was. The effect was to take the power of final decision away from Himmler without specifically giving it to Wenck which probably suited Guderian exactly, since he seems to have been intent mainly on using Wenck to force his own concepts on the army group. Wenck turns up to find the units for the offensive not fully assembled or equipped. Well, at least he inspects them. Himmler has not done so. And he realizes he's going to have to throw in the units one at a time. The Answalde attack the 15th is by one division, and the whole thing is a general failure and is called off, but it does have an effect on the Soviets, which may be a big one. Okay, at this point, first Belarusian and first Ukrainian fronts are deployed for an eventual drive on Berlin, right? This little counterattack does not disturb that deployment at all. But today the 17th, Stavka orders Zhukov to turn north and attack Army Group Vistula together with 2nd Belarusian Front in his next offensive and not attack towards Berlin. As for Ivan Konyev's 1st Ukrainian Front attacks, his drive that began last week continues. He has all kinds of shortages, so he concentrates his two tank armies right behind the infantry for maximum tight shock power. Already by the 11th, he has broken through 65 kilometers deep across a 150 kilometer front. They've surrounded 4,100 German soldiers and 7,800 civilians at Glogau and approached the Nice River. However, Breslau is still a big issue, which prevents the advance of 5th Guards and 6th Armies until the 15th when they link up west of the city, surrounding 35,000 of the enemy and 116,000 civilians. 3rd Guard's tank army has been diverted south to provide maximum force to make the encirclement. After that, they turn west to drive for the Nice. Breslau is not the only place the Soviets have surrounded just now. They've had Budapest under siege for many weeks at this point. In Budapest, the morning of the 11th, Axis commander Karl Pfeffer Wildenbruch issues orders for a breakout. They cannot hold on to any of the city any longer. That night, they try to break out along the Italian boulevard. Most of them don't survive to reach the suburbs. Of some 30,000 Germans and Hungarians, fewer than 700 make it to the German lines. They also leave 10,600 wounded behind. On the 13th, the siege and battle of Budapest comes to its end. Over 100,000 German prisoners have been taken in the fight for the city. There is other stuff going on in Hungary this week, too. At the end of last week, German Army Group South Commander Otto Wohler returned from Berlin, and Hitler had given him permission to use 1st SS Panzer Corps to hit the Soviets' Hron River bridgehead to prevent them from using it as a jumping-off point for attacks against Bratislava or Vienna. This begins today the 17th and takes the Soviets by complete surprise and soon pushes the front to the river. It's not just the operation of taking Budapest that ends this week. There is an allied operation in Italy that also ends that I didn't have time to mention starting last week. Operation Fourth Term. U.S. 5th Army Commander Lucian Truscott wanted to make an attack with 4th Corps to take La Spezia on the coast, but that turned out to be too ambitious. So an operation was designed to just improve positions. Two regiments from the 92nd Division, the only African-American combat division in Europe, the others are support, launched a diversion attack in the Sergio River Valley back on the 4th. They had to withdraw after a few days, though. Then, on the 8th, the main offensive began up the coast. This, too, ran into stiff defenses, and now on the 11th, it's called off. 
But what about the Allied operation that was postponed last week on the Western Front, Operation Grenade? The Germans flooded the Ruhr River from the upstream dams. So all this week, Bill Simpson's U.S. 9th Army is still unable to launch the operation, which begins by crossing the river. The currents are still too strong for that, though. As for the Canadian 1st Army's Operation Veritable further north, it proceeds and eats up more ground this week. I went over the plans for the three phases last week. Phase 1 is completed this week. On the 11th, the British and Canadians take Kleve. The 13th, the British clear the last Germans from the Reichswald. The 14th, the offensive reaches the south bank of the Rhine opposite Emmerich. And today, as the week ends, the Canadians have now reached the Rhine on a 15-kilometer front. While Simpson bided his time, the Canadian 1st Army, composed of both British and Canadian Corps, of necessity carried the weight of the Allied attack. The ponderous, muddy trudge from Nijmegen averaged a bit more than a mile a day, bagging 11,000 enemy prisoners and reducing a score of German villages to half-timbered ash. German commander in the West, Gerd von Rundstedt, reports the 12th that Army Group B, facing the attacks, has fewer than 300 tanks left and the infantry strength is down to seven divisions. They might not be able to cross the Ruhr this week, but the Allies are crossing the Irrawaddy River in Burma. The night of the 12th, 20th Division from 33rd Corps begins crossing opposite Mianmu. They achieve surprise and land pretty much unopposed. Japanese counterattacks don't really get moving until the 15th, but when they did move, the impact was devastating, for they struck with two weapons unusual for the Japanese fighter planes and flamethrowers. Ferocious combat ensued, with the enemy at first trying to drive a wedge between the two brigades. But once again, the Japanese made their old mistake of throwing in each new wave of reinforcements piecemeal, instead of accumulating for a single devastating onslaught. This is a problem, but Allied air superiority soon chases away the Zeros, and the sting is taken out of the Japanese attacks when rocket-firing hurricanes knock out over a dozen Japanese tanks in a day. But the bridgehead is anything but secure. Now, the first phase of 4th Corps crossing the river to the south begins with 7th Division's assault crossing the night of the 13th, just above Nyangu. Something to consider about river crossings in Burma. Like most large rivers, the Irrawaddy bore little resemblance to the blue waterway shown on maps. Each monsoon altered the channel and sandbanks. The shortage of river craft and their inherent unreliability compounded the difficulty. Outboard engines on the boats proved only about 50% reliable. And the shortage of boats meant that the assault crossings had to be timed precisely so that craft could be switched from one crossing site to another. For all these reasons, 7th Division would now have to make the longest river crossing in any theater anywhere in World War II. Well, Phase 1 does not begin well. The boats can't deal with the strong current, and there's a machine gun firing on the far bank. One company of South Lanx does cross, but the rest of the crossing is called off, leaving them stranded. But a boat arrives from Pagan, the old Burmese capital in ancient times, with a couple of guys from Chandra Bose's Indian National Army who fight with the Japanese. They are under a white flag, though, and they say that the Japanese have abandoned their positions on the other side of the river. This turns out to be true, and the crossings continue, and they have a bridgehead soon enough set up. Today, the 17th, 17th Division crosses. They, who are to break out of the bridgehead and attack Mike Tila, and it is only today the Japanese finally attack. They don't have the numbers to win and they dig in at Nyangu town. This has a huge network of tunnels and caves. But slight spoiler, when airstrikes and napalm cannot get the Japanese out, the British will seal up the tunnels and bury them alive. Pagan surrenders without a fight. The Japanese are certainly putting up a fight in the Philippines though. The drive to seal off Bataan Peninsula on Luzon continues this week. Bill Chase becomes commander of 38th Division, the 7th, and days later, after constant attacks, breaks through Zigzag Pass from both east and west. On the 12th, 
the neck across Bataan is closed. The clearing process can now begin. The 13th, the U.S. Navy begins operations in Manila Bay, shelling the enemy and clearing minefields. On the 16th, two U.S. battalions, one arriving by sea and one by a parachute, land on Corregidor Island. They estimate the Japanese garrison there to be around a thousand men. It's actually more like 5,000, and they're using the Malinta Tunnel as the backbone of their defenses. Remember three years ago, how long the Americans held out in the tunnel when the positions were reversed? Yeah, this very much worries Douglas MacArthur. Still, the Japanese are caught by surprise, and within a few hours, all of their strong points are isolated, and they will have an uncoordinated defense. By now in Manila, 1st Cavalry Division is pushing in the south of the city, while 37th Division pushes west past the Provisor Paco line, aiming at Intramuros on the Pasig near the harbor. There are a few strong points to take care of en route. 1st Cavalry has to deal with La Salle University and the baseball stadium and sports complex next to it. With heavy artillery support, they take La Salle and break into the complex, but they are thrown out once again. Then, they use tanks to break through a concrete wall into the baseball field, using flamethrowers to clear bunkers in left field, and machine guns to clear strong points behind third base. After securing the field, they head for the High Commissioner's residence and the Army Navy Club. 37th Division spends their time trying to take a group of buildings around the new police station, which is made with reinforced concrete. There's a church, a college, a shoe factory, and all of them have serious sandbag defenses and mutually interlocking fields of machine gun fire. By week's end, this is far from overcome. Japan itself is being attacked this week, actually. Task Force 58, now under Ray Spruance as part of 5th Fleet, attacks Tokyo the 16th and Tokyo and Yokohama the 17th. This is aerial attacks from 12 fleet carriers and four light ones. They lose 88 planes, but they take down like 170 or so. They have eight battleships, 15 cruisers, and 83 destroyers as escorts. Then they move off towards Iwo Jima. The preliminary bombardment of Iwo Jima also begins the 16th with Burt Rogers leading Task Force 54, six battleships, five cruisers, and six destroyers, and Task Force 52's 10 escort carriers, now with napalm bombs. B-17 bombers join the raids on the 17th. As for Iwo Jima, three marine divisions had rehearsed for the Iwo Jima assault operation, which had been masterminded by Admiral Kelly Turner and General Holland Smith. The marine commander, anticipating a possible 20,000 casualties, was predicting it would be the toughest place we have had to take. Well, the taking of it, which begins in two days, has been assigned to the 4th and 5th Marine Divisions under Cliff Cates and Keller Rocky. The 5th is a new division, actually, and with Graves Erskine's 3rd in reserve. More Costello here. Unit commanders had briefed their men on the exacting task ahead with the aid of foam rubber models of the island that pinpointed the many enemy pillboxes, gun emplacements, and block houses visible from the aerial photographs. What, however, was invisible was the extensive network of underground trenches and tunnels that they anticipated riddled the volcanic peak, making Iwo Jima the modern equivalent of a medieval castle. Mount Suribachi, then, is the castle's keep, and it dominates the landing beaches on the south of the island. But even the area between the mountain and the beach is heavily defended. Recon photos have picked out more than 200 gun emplacements and 21 blockhouses, and the shore for the landings rises inland in a series of five-meter ridges. The north of the island is a plateau, and that's where the airfields are, and they're defended by rows and rows of interconnected trenches with interlocking fields of fire. From above, Iwo Jima looks like an ice cream cone on its side, with the contents dripping to the east. At the southern tip, almost surrounded by ocean, the burly hump of Mount Suribachi, an inactive volcano, rises to 550 feet. North from Suribachi, the island widens along a two-mile isthmus, with beaches on both sides, and then rises to a landmass two to three miles in length and width, with tableland fit for another airfield in the middle, surrounded by land with trees and scrub, ravines and gullies, 
ridges and jagged hills, and edged with cliffs. The island has no harbor, and its population has been removed. The landings are on the south side of the island because the wind and the surf make the west much trickier. Smith is likely right that it will be a tough nut to crack, and he's asked for 10 days of continuous naval bombardment to take out as many of the gun positions as possible. But that's not possible. Chester Nimitz has yet to get back the six battleships attached to Douglas MacArthur and 7th Fleet, and Task Force 58 is with that bombardment of Tokyo and Yokohama to prevent kamikazes from heading here. MacArthur has been keeping the battleships until his air forces can move to Luzon. One of them, West Virginia, will arrive in time for the Iwo Jima landings, though not the bombardment. If kamikazes do make it here, they could do an awful lot of damage because by this week, there are a quarter of a million men from the Army, Navy, Air Forces, and Marines assembled to take Iwo Jima. And they are in over 900 ships heading there from Ulithi and Saipan, a kamikaze's dream. The schedule calls for them to take the island in four days. Japanese commander Tadamichi Kuribayashi was appointed by former Japanese Prime Minister Tojo last May to run the defense of what he knew would be a jumping off point for any invasion of Japan. His men are in deep cover from the bombardment and they await the landings. He's not going to waste any men defending the beaches, but plans to hit the Americans when they've landed and the beaches are crowded. He was not looking for victory over the enemy, but for ways to make his advance so costly, it would slow the advance on Japan and perhaps give the Japanese some bargaining power. To do this, he would fortify the rest of the island, the peninsula, Suribachi, and the higher, rougher terrain in the north, so heavily that the American advance in the open would always be under fire. His garrison numbers 21,000 and his cave system is 16 kilometers of caves connecting Suribachi with the north, averaging 10 meters underground. As for guns, he has 33 naval coastal guns, 80 millimeters or bigger, 361 artillery pieces of 75 or more, 69 anti-tank guns, and 200 AA guns, 65 small and medium mortars, and 12 gigantic 320 millimeter mortars. This is all protected by both light and heavy machine guns, of course, in those concrete bunkers and pillboxes. And everything is camouflaged and with interlocking fields of fire. Four days, huh? Well, with the following notes, these seven days of the war are over. On the 13th and 14th is the firebombing of Dresden. This is not a military target and is a city with a strong cultural heritage so this becomes a controversial raid. Dresden is also crowded just now with refugees from the Eastern Front. On the 14th is the bombing of Prague. American planes hit the wrong city. Both of these, especially Dresden, are covered in detail in the War Against Humanity series, so you should very much check that out. On the 12th, Peru declares war on Germany and Japan. On the 15th, Venezuela and Uruguay do the same. And the week ends with a German counterattack in the east, maybe changing Stavka's plans. The end of the siege of Budapest, Operation Veritable reaching the Rhine on a broad front, the Allies crossing the Irrawaddy, Luzon slowly falling to the Americans, and a mighty armada making for Iwo Jima. Where the commander plans to not defeat the enemy, but make his eventual victory costly, and both buy time for his country and also give it bargaining power. Bargaining power for what, you ask? Hmm. Last week, we came out with a video about war goals. Which nation has what plans for the end of the war, for what comes after? Neither Germany nor Japan realistically think they can win the war at this point, but what are their plans for after? What is Britain's? What about the Soviets and the Americans? Well, here's the deal. They all have different ideas about what is to come next. Very different ideas. And you know what might happen with nations having very different ideas about what happens after this war? Yep, a whole lot more war in the future. But where is all this heading? 
For real, all the various nations have different war goals. We just did that long special about the various nations' war goals, and you can check that out right here. It is very important to keep that stuff in mind over the next few months. It'll come up in just a minute. And you can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com, for that is what keeps this whole adventure going. Benjelin is the TG, is the Time Ghost Army member of the week, Benjelin. And these are the newest commissioned officers. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.